So in this segment, we're going to start looking at alloys. Um, so we've looked at micrographs and we've defined what we mean by phases. Um, and then when we come to the end of the segment, we're going to start looking at our first phase diagram, um, which has a, a, a liquid phase and a solid phase, both of which can dissolve as much of A or B atoms in them as possible. It's a sort of ideal case. And we have a two-phase region in between. We'll look at that towards the end of the segment. But first, we want to think about alloys. So here's a, a chunk of metal, um, and it's composed of lots of grains. That's what we saw in the micrograph last time. Those grains are individual little single crystals, um, and they can be any size from sort of hundreds of nanometers up to millimeters in size, maybe even centimeters. But usually a typical grain size for a metal would be something like 60 microns or so, 60 micrometers. Um, and if we zoomed in on the individual grains, we'd find individual um, atomic columns, an infinite repeating lattice of atoms. And we could do that in a high-res TEM down in the basement. Um, so in, in the Titan or in the, the TEM that's arriving in January. Um, then we, if we formed an alloy, if we took aluminium, for example, we can put a little bit of magnesium in. It's still FCC aluminium. Pure aluminium is FCC. And we can put a little bit of magnesium in, and that just goes into the FCC lattice at random. So in the diagram here, we've just put some blue B atoms in randomly on the A lattice. And that's called a single phase alloy. It's just the same as it was for aluminium, but some of the atoms are slightly different. Some of them are B rather than A. Um, another option is um, something slightly different where we form two phases. But in this case, where we don't change the phase that's there, it's called a solid solution. So when you made a solution in chemistry in school, then you would take uh, something like water or, and put in some sugar and dissolve it up, and that was a solution of sugar in water. Well, we can have a solution of B atoms in A atoms. We can have a solution of magnesium in aluminium. And usually, if, it's, if they're similar size atoms, those B atoms would substitute into the lattice. And that's called a substitutional solid solution. There is, however, another option, which is there are little gaps in the lattice in between the atoms. If atoms are roughly speaking spheres in a hard sphere model, then there are little gaps between the spheres. And for very small atoms, things like carbon and iron, hydrogen and zirconium, things like that, then those can go in the gaps. We call the gaps interstices, um, so they're called interstitial solutions, um, and it's in a solid, so it's an interstitial solid solution. And those are the two options, those are both called solid solution alloys. So iron, for instance, iron is a, um, quite commonly has carbon in, and even single phase steels will have carbon in them, and they're interstitial solid solutions therefore. Now, another option is a two-phase alloy, and that's where we might have a, a, a B phase, a beta phase, that consists of blue atoms, say, with a, possibly a few white atoms in. So it's a solution, and then there's another phase, which is also a solution. Say that was a phase alpha of predominantly white atoms with a few B, blue ones in them. And the phase alpha would correspond to A, to atoms of A, probably, but that's just a convention. We just give the phases whatever name we like, so we tend to give them Greek letters. So a two-phase alloy would consist of two different phases, alpha and beta, which would have different crystal structures and different compositions, but both could have a range. Both could, each phase could be a solution. It wouldn't be a pure uh, stoichiometric compound or a pure element. Now, another third option, rather than having a phase beta that was predominantly B, we could have a phase beta that was a mixture, say a 50-50 mixture, 50%, 50% of white and blue atoms. So that would have, the uh, if white was aluminium and blue was, um, I don't know, copper, I don't think this phase exists, but an alum that would be an ALCU compound. And a, that, that would be, uh, say, a compound where the white and blue atoms were bonded to each other, but you never had blue-blue pairs. Um, and that would be what you've got depicted in this chart here. And that's called an intermetallic phase, that phase beta. But that's still a two-phase material consisting of alpha and beta phases. Now, what are we trying to do here? Let's just think for a moment about what we're trying to do. We're trying to control how we the phase assembly we get, and therefore the properties we get, so that is the phases that are there, um, the compositions of them, the sizes of them, the arrangement of them, um, and we can control that by the processing we use. 
So first we solidify our alloy, um, then we might uh, deform it, hot roll it, um, and then we might do a little bit of finishing operations, some machining or something like that. And what we're doing here is we're making very large amounts of material. A standard melt in a steel mill is 200 tons. So we're making a microstructure down at the hundreds of nanometers scale on tons of material at a time. And that means we can do it cheaply and we can produce vast quantities of material. All the steel that you're sitting on and in cars and in buildings and everything else, we produce it in, in mass. Correspondingly, if you look at your mobile phone, if you look at chips there, we make the microstructure by hand, by patterning. Um, and that's a long, slow, expensive, tedious process. And we can't make large amounts of that material cheaply. So what we can do here is we're using hitting things, heating them, cooling them, and how we do those to control the microstructure of the material. And what we're doing is we're getting the physics to make the microstructure for us. We're getting the physics to do the handiwork rather than coming along and trying to do it ourselves. And that's how, and what we're studying then is how processing can control the microstructure, can control the properties. And that's the, the concept. So processing things like temperature and time, the microstructure, the size and distribution of grains and phases, and that controls the properties like the strength and the ductility. Um, so that's what we're trying to do, and that's what Mark Menwin will, will really talk about, but that's why we're doing this. And that means we need to know what phases are present at different temperatures during processing. So now we go to the next segment. So if we look at what happens with a uh, phase diagram, then this is the, the water pressure temperature phase diagram we saw before. So we've got a solid phase, a liquid phase, and a vapor phase. And we're here at 10 to the 5 pascals at 1 atmosphere, um, and 0.1 megapascals, if you like. And at 0 degrees C, liquid turns to solid ice. And at 100 degrees C, then liquid turns to vapor. So what happens when you uh, solidify water? So if you cool it down, So I'm going to plot temperature against time sure. in degree C. If we cool down water, you know, say it starts off at some temperature above, above the melting point, cool it down, and then what happens? Well, you've got to uh, have a release of latent heat. You can keep on taking heat out of it for a while, and it doesn't change temperature because you're solidifying into ice. So you get an arrest, and then you carry on. Same happens if you heat up, if you're heating up water, you've got a, an arrest there while you're boiling it away and converting it to steam and doing all the latent heat. So you have this sort of a, a, an arrest which you get from a pure solid when it goes through a phase transformation from liquid to solid. So the next thing we want to think about is what happens if we do that um, not with a pure metal but um, with a uh, uh, an alloy. So we're looking at a different type of phase diagram. So we've got a phase diagram here for an alloy. So this will be an alloy phase diagram. And the simplest sort of phase diagram we can possibly have, again we've got temperature here in degree C say, but here we've got composition from say pure A to pure B, two types of atoms A and B. And this will be, you know, weight percent B, going from you know 0 percent to hundred um, percent. And the simplest type of phase diagram we can possibly have is one where we have complete solubility in the liquid and complete solubility in the solid. And what we see is we see a phase diagram that looks like this. So if we call that the liquid phase L and the solid phase S, we'll have an L plus S region here, a two phase region. What that means is if I take pure A, it solidifies at a, at a single temperature that's characteristic of that element A, um, or that molecule, if it's a molecule like water. So something like aluminium has a single melting point, single freezing point. Um, if I take a uh, pure element B, it has a single freezing point. But if I add a little bit of B to A, there's a region here 
where you have a mixture of liquid and solid. So we have a mixture here of liquid and solid over a range of temperatures. So if we have an alloy, what we find is that we get a, a region over which solidification occurs. The other thing we find is that solidification occurs over at a slightly depressed temperature. So let's think about where we are for an alloy here. It's all liquid and we start entering the liquid plus solid region at this point. And we call this line here, we call this the liquidus line. And we call this line here, coincidentally, the solidus line. And at this point here, we enter the liquid plus solid region. So what we have is we have a situation um, where we have started to form a little bit of solid. So let's plot that out on a diagram. So if we've got the composition here against the volume fraction, so that's the composition, um, and this is in weight percent, since that's what the diagram is in, against the volume fraction. So that's going from zero to one. So first off, what we do is we start off and it's all liquid of this alloy composition, which we'll call C here. Call that the alloy composition. And when we come down here, we come down to this point and we start forming a little bit of solid. And the first bit of solid we form is there. This is, if you like, the forbidden region. What we do at any given temperature, what we see is we have a possible, if we're in this two-phase region, we have solid of this composition and liquid of this composition. If we're down at this temperature, here it would be solid of that composition and liquid of that one, and so on. So the first solid we start to form, we start to form a relatively pure A, relatively pure solid. So that's down here in composition. That's the first solid we form. It's down here at whatever this number is. So we'll call that, I don't know, the first solid to form C naught or something like that. C naught. And the liquid then, because we've only formed a little bit of it, this amount of solute hasn't had, is, is a tiny amount. This is a tiny volume fraction, but it would enrich the liquid a little bit. Um, so then when we come down in, composite, in temperature again, if we've gone from here down to here, then we have solid of this composition and liquid of this composition. And we'd have more solid at that point because we'd have to be able to balance it out to preserve the number of atoms. So we'd now be slightly enriched and our solid would be something like that. And our liquid then would be up here over at this composition. Whatever that number is over at that composition. And the volume fraction, we'd have an amount here, an amount here, and overall, we'd still average out to the same composition of the alloy. And then, when we got down, finally, down to this temperature, keep on going down, we'd have solid of the alloy composition, and the last liquid would be very, very enriched. So then we'd, our solid would be enriched again. I'm going to rub this out. Um, so, there's our alloy composition. And now, our solid is actually the alloy composition, and we've got no liquid left, but the last liquid form be really, really enriched, really up there somewhere. So, that very last liquid, there'd be a tiny little bit up there somewhere. Very, very enriched. It's not all the way to one, but it's, it's very enriched. So, what we've then done is we've solidified over a range of temperatures. So, the latent heat associated with the transformation will have to have been evolved over a range of temperatures. And this started at a lower number than before. So rather than, so our cooling curve would go to a lower number and then we'd evolve the latent heat over a range, over this range of temperatures here, this amount there. So then we'd evolve the latent heat over this range here. So this is when solidification starts and this is where it ends, at that temperature and that temperature. So we evolve the latent heat over a whole range of compositions. And that's how it, the situation would work in that scenario. Um,
So for an alloy, we evolved the latent heat over a whole range of compositions. And if you went to pure B, well, what would it be? For pure B, it's solidifying down at this lower temperature again. So for pure B, let's see, pure B here, pure B, it would be over a range of temperatures, but it would now have, a, have an arrest there at that temperature there. Um, and now I need to go and extend my graph a bit and clean this up. But that's the great thing about being able to sketch, is that you can tidy up your graph. Time in seconds. And so this is pure B. This graph was the one we first plotted. That's pure A. And in the middle, you've got an alloy. So the interpretation of this diagram is that pure A and pure B solidify at a single temperature, and that's got to be true of pure elements. If we have a mixture, we see that um, we evolve the latent heat over a range of temperatures because it solidifies over a range of temperatures in this two-phase region of liquid plus solid. And so the latent heat's evolved over a range of temperatures. We don't get this arrest as we're giving up the latent heat. Um, and so we and that sort of makes sense. If you imagine, if you have ever done this with salty water, if you take pure water, it freezes at zero degrees C, and it's impossible, um, except at, during that freezing process, to have a mush. So if you have uh, solid ice in contact with liquid water, the temperature must be zero degrees. Um, and Therefore, that's, that's, that's handy if you've got a cold drink. You know your cold drink is actually at a given temperature. If you take salty water, if you take a solution, that solidifies over a range of temperatures or freezes over a range of temperatures, and you get a mush. So that happens in winter if you're in a cold country. Then you have a mush of salty water and ice brine. It's nasty. It tends to get kind of brown and mucky. And um, it's not, there's just dirt in the water. And you have a mush, you have a range of temperatures at which you have the liquid and solid being present. And that physically will always happen for a binary or for anything that isn't a pure element. Um, and so that's how cooling curves work. And you'll get to try this out. You'll get to make aluminium silicon alloys where you try this out in the lab over the coming few weeks. In fact, they're a bit more complicated to phase diagram than this. And that's the subject of uh, the next lecture.